Um, I'm, I'm very disappointed by my paper in all sorts of ways and, um, because I, I, what I've done, but I mean, just, there is a bit of method in it, which is that I sort of think theology, doing moral theology well is hard, and um, I've stepped back from it. So what the paper, I hope, will be about when it's finished is not there at the moment, because <laughs> I'm still thinking about it, uh, and I've been doing some preparatory thinking uh, towards what the paper will look like. Now, I, I mean, this was a... This was billed, I think, as a, I hope as a consultation, so I hope it's acceptable to come with half eight um, thoughts and, and know that you'll be able to improve them for me. Um, in in, a, in a, a book I published last year, um, uh, in Everyday Ethics, I, one of the questions I asked myself, and it fits in with, with this conference, is what are children and what are they for? And I began to start thinking about that. And it, in most of our everyday context, funny people have asked me, including, including the man at um, JFK, said, you know, where are you going? Uh, you know, what are you doing? Um, what are you giving a lecture on? <laughs> and I said, you know, I'm, giving, I'm going to give a talk on children, what they're for. And I think people look at you as if you're slightly mad. I mean, you know, what, what are children, what are they for? Or, or how, I, sometimes I say to people, how do you conceive? How do we conceive children? They say, you don't know how we conceive children. <laughs> I'm an academic. But, um, but you know what I'm... Um, but these questions seem to be odd to me, to, to our, to our um, contemporaries. Um, they're not questions which we regularly consciously ask. But it seems to me that whether we ask them or not, we effectively answer them in practice um, all the time in the countless various and probably competing notions of what a child is and is for, which we propose to ourselves in our schooling practices, in practices of socialization, family socialization and upbringing, and perhaps especially in the relentless advertising and disparate social media, media which picture t children to us. So even when we don't ask these questions, we certainly answer them, only perhaps not very reflectively, possibly somewhat uncritically, or even thoughtlessly, with the risk of all sorts of competing constructions or confusions about children. And I do think we seem, and I, I, we, the we is an awful word, but I keep using it, and sometimes it means you know, me and some people I know, sometimes it means the West, sometimes. But we, and you can just interpret it as you see fit uh, in the context, if it doesn't apply to you, it's obviously me and my friends. We do seem to be confused about uh, children. Um, I, I mean, I'll speak UK-wide about the UK. Um, the child seems to be in the UK a highly ambiguous thing. Uh, some go to great extremes to conceive a child as if their lives would be deeply and hopelessly bereft without a child. Others go to extremes to be rid of a child as if their lives would be wrecked if they had one. Um, or to mention something else, children serve, culturally speaking, as icons of innocence and wonder, and yet at the same time, um, in the UK, uh, it seems to me that children, and I mean girls actually, are sexualised to an astonishing degree, um, ever younger, with clothes and makeup borrowed from an adult and far from an innocent world. And there again, where ch whereas children are now cosseted and cared for and removed from the world of work, which is in a way which would astonish, astonish people in most cultures, and most people even in, in Western culture 125 years ago, um, we've got an education system, again, this is a UK reference, I don't know whether it applies in the UK, or in the US, which seems ever more geared to serving as a production line for the specific demands of the economy, now utilitarian demands of our economy. So there's not much time for innocence and wonder, which is what we hold children up as, innocent and wondrous, in primary <coughs> school, uh, first grade or whatever, when there are exams to pass and key stage milestones to attain even when you're about four and a half. Um, my daughters just started nursery school, and they started discussing the syllabus with me. And she's, she's 20 months for, for <laughs> you know, what, she hoped to, what we'd hope her to learn. I, mean, I thought she, I think she was going to be happy anyway, but uh, she is happy to learn. So I, I very much welcome the focus of the com uh, this consultation, inviting us to think about birthing, which I think is a key site in our framing of children. One of the ways in which we frame children is, is through birth and how we think about birth. And indeed, I, of course, welcome the, the encouragement to think from a Christian perspective. Although, as I say, I've sort of stepped back, and, and I hope I'll be able to speak more clearly about that with your help and I thought more. So, I, I've made a modest start in one direction in the paper by thinking about the notion of a child of a gift. And it's a bit like a painter. I've blocked out some main um, features, and the picture's not finished. And, and when it is finished, it might not be quite the same. But here are the four blocks, the four themes in the paper, which I hope you already identified since they were that they are broad block uh, pictures. Uh, 
My first claim is that the typical modern child is not received as a gift, but is rather, in a way which James's paper also suggests, um, and develops more carefully, is more likely conceived under the dominating logic of uh, production um, and the related logic of consumption. So the child is not. Uh, you know, I, I enjoyed the, 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 you know, the child is a gift, said the first, and then said the Christian tradition says the child is a gift, but it does seem to be the claim the child is a gift, and it, it may be true as a Christian claim, but it's not a straightforwardly descriptive claim about how children are received in our contemporary Western culture. Now, having said that, I immediately want to sort of backtrack and present a difficulty, which is just that an, ep an ethnography of the everyday regarding birth is just not, not available, I think. I mean, if someone thinks it is available and they can tell me where it is, I'd like to know where it is. But to borrow a point that uh, Professor Beattie makes very tellingly, the stories of children's birth are told, first of all, and properly first of all, and typically by women who do the birthing. Um, and I suspect that a fine-grained ethnography of the kind that we seem to lack for everyday birthing in our everyday world would chart all sorts of ways in which mothers resist the dominating logics, which I've mentioned in my paper and James mentioned in his, in fashioning. So I, I, I suspect mothers actually resist these uh, dominating logics in all sorts of ways, fash fashioning counter-narratives to conceive the births of their children. So in, in, in the book I mentioned, uh, the little book I published last year, um, I've drawn attention to one instance of resistance to the dominant stories in uh, Klassen's study of home birthing amongst women who are very consciously taking a stand against the meaning of children as posed by hospital birth. And that's a book called Blessed Events, Religion and Home Birth in America. But I also mentioned the fact of a wider resistance, uh, witnessed resistance to these dominating logics in an important book by uh, social anthropologist colleague, uh, Cheryl Matin, a very important book, I think, called Moral Laboratories, Family Peril and the Struggle for a Good Life, which has only just come out or last year. Uh, you may know it most likely. Um, uh, and in this book, Mattingly tells some extremely powerful stories, many of them involving implicit narratives regarding the meaning of children which counter the technocratic consumerist logic that I've mentioned as a dominating logic. But what is striking, given my next uh, claim I'm going to come to in a moment, is it is very striking that these um, narratives that she tells um, arise in context of relative hardship, where the do dominant narratives of production and consumption simply fail, because the child or the demands of raising a child just don't accord with those conceptions. So the child comes off the production line flawed in some way, or rather than contributing to any parental life goals, threatens them. So the logics that have perhaps worked for affluent middle class people just don't work. And in these contexts, I think the language of gift does some work. Anyway, what's clear is that any construction of parenthood through metaphors of production or through consumerist expectations um, is, I think, I don't, I don't suggest a whole a thesis, this is what happens with children. I think we, we lack the ethnography, and I suspect there is resistance. But I do think that is, that perhaps it's, it's enough to say that we have to resist this uh, narrative, which is such a predominant one in our culture. So the first thesis is that with all those qualifications, the child of modernity is not conceived chiefly or first of all as given, but is produced uh, as an achievement, not as a gift. My second thesis is that though the conception of a child uh, does not, um, conception of the child as a gift does not seem to govern the main sites of birthing, it does do creative, important and surprising work in other contexts where, as I've already said, the child itself or the manner of the child's arriving is irregular. So in my paper, I mentioned some of those sites where the child is unintended, where there's pregnancy loss, where the child is handicapped. And I discuss another such site where the child is conceived of a gift, quite surprisingly, that of surrogacy. So I notice this exactly at the sites where the conception of a child of a product is, even within our own immediate context, remarked upon. So that's the surrogacy example we immediately remark upon. The conception of the child there is in danger of being a project. Um, uh, and we worry about it. It's exactly there, quite surprisingly, where certain surrogate mothers and surrogate parents between them seek to tell stories and follow practices in relation to the surrogacy which seek to deny the construction of the birth in the terms which a critical culture has imposed on it. There's something <coughs> further to think about there, I think. 
So my third thesis lies in the claim that the Christian conceptuality of the child as a gift is central to the foundational practices of baptism and godparenthood. I probably shouldn't say much about baptism and godparenthood. I can get rather sort of preachy about it. I've become a bit of an enthusiast for, for godparenthood, and I can bore for England, um, or for Britain, maybe for Europe, on um, godparenthood, um, which is an interesting, uh, striking phenomenon. Um, what, one of the things I've tried to argue in, in, in the book, I, I, I'm coming to the end, I think, so I don't, don't worry, I'm, gonna get, I'm not going to be on much longer, but um, that it seems to me that one of the sites we've thought about children it, it, it recently, the key site has been childlessness um, over the last 30, 40 years. It's the place where we've thought hardest about what children are, is about what, what it is not to have children. Mm -hmm. And uh, a colleague of mine in Cambridge, Sarah Franklin, a sociologist anthropologist, um, argues, and I, I think persuasively, uh, to a large degree, that, that the notion of the desperation of childness is answered by um, uh, a child of one's own are two very dominant motifs in thinking about children. It's under the sway of these two thoughts, uh, desperation of childlessness and the child of one's own, that we um, come to think about what it is to have a child. Baptism, I mean, baptism and godparenthood, I like to say, repudiates both notion, notions. It denies the desperation of childlessness. No one is childless is what baptism proclaims. And godparenthood uh, and baptism together deny that you can have a child of your own. It's the one thing you can't have in baptism. You don't, baptism tells you you do not have a child of your own. Um, the most striking thing about this right of reception, anthropologically speaking, I'm not, uh, you know, lots of rights of reception, but if, if, if you know, one of my colleagues who works in, you know, Papua or somewhere came back and said they have a right of reception of, the ch of children, and the one thing, they, the one pe people who are never allowed to be there are parents. Most of them say, there aren't, aren't those people in Papua New Guinea? But of course, baptism historically, and God, baptism precluded parents. It wasn't always a universal phenomenon. It was resisted, and I think it's a worldly resistance of a theological uh, idea. But parents were, were typically excluded. So if you take just the Book of Common Prayer, the, the, the traditions which I don't the, 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 the Anglican tradition, parents are only mentioned once in the whole service in the rubrics, and that's that they're, they're the people who might ask for their child to be baptised, but after that they're thoroughly and systematically ignored. Um, and the key roles in the service are taken by, by godparents. So um, the parents are effaced, displaced, even replaced um, by, by godparents. Now that is not a, that's partly a normative description of what godparents would, should be in the Christian tradition. And again, I say I can bore, bore, bore for England on the subject of godparents, so clear. I'll talk about the details if you want, but I mean, it does seem to me that is the core logic of baptism and uh, godparenthood to um, affect a Christian kinship um, in place of uh, what some people might term gender natural kinship. But I mean, so my first and fourth and last thesis, and the one I haven't developed, but I, I hope to, concerns what it means for Christian thought and practice, and this is where most people would like us to go, and, and quite rightly, um, what it means for Christian thought and practice that Christ's birth, notwithstanding its particularity, without a father and a mother. I love those paradoxes of Augustine, loves, without a father and a mother, without a father as man, without a mother as God. Um, how was it that this hugely particular birth came to be the lens through which, as I think it was, through which human birth was imagined in construction? So what contribution has this made? And what contribution might it now make, more importantly, to the construction of children? Um, so, this afternoon, I, I just mentioned my first thesis that our contemporary children are not manifestly received as a gift, but framed as products of consumer goods. And I immediately felt bound to qualify from saying, I think women typically in, 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 our, in uh, British culture, UK culture, do. Um, resist those dominating logics, and I suspect if they resist in the West those dominating logics, they largely do so because they are inheritors of a Christian way of thinking about birth. So the, the notion of a child as a gift, which could trip off the tongue, though I don't think it's actually it does much work in everyday conversation in the UK, um, I suspect these are the relics, uh, fragments of a Christian framing of children in the life of the conception of Christ, the birth of Christ. Now, um, I didn't in the paper establish, I'm not going to do it, try and do it here, I haven't established that Christ's birth did indeed function as a master narrative for other birthing stories, but I would argue at the time that it does. But I just want to stress something of the cultural particularity of the conception of child and parent, which grows out of the universalising of the Christ's birth 
as a form of human birthing, as the form of human birthing. Most striking in this conception, I think, is just a reversal of what, of, of what might well be the normal ordering of child and parent. Since in the stories of Christ, in which the stories of other children came to be conceived, it's the parents who serve the child. It's very noticeable in most cultures, most of the time. Uh, uh, we could say that uh, children are ordered to parents, not parents to children. I mean, it's the pa children are had, are born, for the sake of serving their parents. It's very striking that the Christian conceptuality, I'm just thinking of an iconographic tradition, has the parents kneeling in worship uh, before the child. So the sentimentality, I don't mean that in the pejorative sense, the sense of the sentiments which emerge, uh, which emerge from this uh, conception of what it is to be a parent and a child is culturally very specific, even if it's not unparalleled. And I just note two anthropologists to, to make, who make a, uh, an important and related point. So I don't know how to pronounce this name without an A. If it was got an A and I'd say Hardy, I'm not sure quite how to pronounce it, H-R-D-Y, but Hardy. Um, so Herdy says, nurturing has to be teased out, reinforced and maintained. Nurturing itself needs to be nurtured. Um, and Shepard Hughes, the usefulness of such ill-defined terms and culturally decontextualized terms as bonding, attachment, critical peer, and so forth must be doubted. So there's something about the cultural specificity of our ideas of nurturing, um, attachment, bonding, and so on. So final uh, thought, to claim that the birth of Christ sentimentalized uh, in a good sense, a certain cultural version is not to allege that it's responsible for a sugary picture which ignores the fact that gifts often bring with them burdens, obligations, and responsibilities. And that's a very important aspect to, get, to pick up your theme of joy, uh, most life. I do think uh, one of the things the paper lacks, and I want, want to put in, is the sense in which the stories Charles Mattingly tells is, of course, and we know this, it's funny how academics you have to learn something after a long struggle that, that every normal person knows, um, that, uh, <laughs> that um, children make people more moral often. Not always, but often. I mean, so the sto stories Mattingly tells are about parents struggling to be moral agents. In really, not me, in, 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 I don't know your circumstances, but not me, you know, I'm, fortunate, affluent, lucky, you know, so, but I mean, she tells stories of people struggling in extraordinary circumstances to be the parents they want to be. It's a huge moral project having a child. So, so it's not the place to do anything like give you a theory of gift, and I'm suspicious of theories of the gift anyway, but I might conclude by observing that I'm struck by the fact that the unto you of the Christmas stories is addressed, of course, not to Mary and Joseph, but to random others. You know, unto you this day is born. It's not addressed to Mary and Joseph. Yeah. It's addressed to, unto you, these others is given. Um, the first words of address to Mary and Joseph um, are that fear not, uh, which is slightly different. Uh, uh, for them both in different ways, this gift will be costly, which is to say that the Christian conceiving of children as gift surely find its echo most authentically in those narratives of gift which occur in our culture amongst those who might have been expected not to experience their children as gift. That's to say where the child is received uh, cultural, culturally speaking, as a deficient and flawed. It's there that we find, I think, the sharpest echo of the Christmas story.